and Christopher Mannion. Dr. Christopher Mannion at the Population Research Institute. And today we are interviewing PRI president, Steve Mosier. Now Steve's scholarship ranges over eight books, thousands of articles on China, international relations, and a host of related issues, many of which we're gonna be discussing today. And we'll move right along because our focus is the new book from PRI. It's available in hard copy and a free ebook right now downloaded on our website, pop.org. It's called Pandemonium. It is a powerful analysis of what the virus has done to the world and is doing in fact, and what certain powerful groups in the world are up to using the virus as their excuse. That's right, as the Wuhan virus lingers on around the, China, the world, it's a powerful impact in the United States that we're gonna be addressing today. Political leaders and magnates many sectors have decided to take advantage of the confusion and uncertainty, and that starts right here in PRI's home state of Virginia. To put it bluntly, they're trying to grow their power and influence. Now to investigate this unprecedented effort, PRI's free ebook reviews the accounts of experts from countries all over the world. Their firsthand reports tell how these power plays are wrecking their countries and how they might wreck our own. You won't find this depth of worldwide analysis anywhere else. This book is available right now at pop.org. Download it now. It begins by looking at the origins of the virus in China and including an incisive analysis by Steve Mosier, our guest. Steve, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Good afternoon, Chris. Good Steve, to be with you again. It's, it's called the China virus. Why? Well, it, it's called the China virus for a very good reason. And, and everyone will recall when President Trump was asked, why does he insist on calling it the China virus? He said simply because it came from China. And he has a, a, a real uh, interesting intonation of the word China, uh, which uh, he sort of bites off. Uh, I think um, there, there, there are going to be repercussions for China down the road when uh, in, in the second term of uh, President Donald Trump, uh, because the virus did indeed come from China. It came from a Wuhan laboratory called the Wuhan Institute of Virology. It was manufactured in the Wuhan Institute of Virology using a coronavirus that was isolated a couple of years ago by the People's Liberation Army, that's the military force of the Chinese Communist Party, loyal to the party, not to the country. The People's Liberation Army isolated the coronavirus that was used as the backbone or the template for the genetically engineered uh, China virus that's causing the Wuhan flu uh, all over the mm -hmm. world. So this was engineered in the lab. It was deliberately spread throughout the world. I bought several months ago from Flight Aware a international airline tracking service, all of the flights information for flights in and out of Wuhan over the last year. And a strange thing happened in January, just when the pandemic was getting underway in China. They stopped flights from Wuhan, the center of the epidemic caused by the China virus, to other Chinese cities, but they allowed the flights to continue to other cities around the world. This bioweapon was deliberately released upon the world. There are a lot of people who aren't willing to put it in such blunt terms, but mm -hmm. I think the evidence is overwhelming that it was not only created in the lab, but it was deliberately released, uh, seeded around the world on flights from Wuhan to places like uh, Milan, uh, Rome, uh, New York, uh, and, and other cities, major cities around the world. That's the origin of the pandemic. And uh, China must pay. There must be a reckoning for China, uh, specifically for the Chinese Communist Party for unleashing this pandemic on the world. But you know, it's been pandemonium. Our book title was chosen deliberately because we're not just talking about uh, the, the guilt, the responsibility of China, the Chinese Communist Party for unleashing a pandemic on, on the world. We have all kinds of actors state actors and non-state actors. We have globalists. Uh, we have progressives in the United States. We have 
all kinds of different actors with different agendas on the American state level, on the national level in the United States, on the international level, and of course, China itself is trying mightily to profit and aggrandize its own power and, and uh, prestige during the course of this pandemic. So there, there's really a lot, lot to talk about, Chris, here. That's why we called it pandemonium. Pan, of course, means all, and demonium, all the demons. This is, this is kind of a, a Pandora's box opened up and all the demons uh, that haunt us uh, from China, uh, from the globalists, uh, from people in the United States who would like to move us towards uh, socialism, all released at once and all attacking our system of government, our way of life, and uh, of course, our very health. Well, you've been to several states recently in our own country looking at the impact of the virus in the United States. What are people telling you? Well, I've had the privilege of being able to travel at a time when a lot of people have been confined to their homes. Uh, my travel schedule began picking up a couple months ago. I've been in the last few weeks, I've been to Illinois, I've been to Ohio, I've been to Kentucky, I've been to Connecticut, uh, I've uh, been to events here in Florida and just got back from an events, uh, event in Pennsylvania. And I'll tell you what, the, the disparate impact of the China virus on the United States it almost follows state borders. And it follows state borders for a reason. There have been two distinctly different, almost diametrically opposed responses uh, to the threat posed by the China virus. Uh, the one response that we see illustrated in red states like Pennsylvania, uh, like Connecticut, where I just was, and of course, like New Jersey and New York and in Illinois, we see democratically elected governors who are Democrats, a member of the members of the Democrat Party, turning almost overnight uh, from democratically elected governors into dictators. And they seize the moment provided by the China virus to lock down their economies, to lock down travel uh, from state to state, uh, I will tell you that when I was in Connecticut a couple of weeks ago, I arrived at the airport in Hartford, Connecticut from Florida, and I was required, uh, if I stayed in the state longer than 24 hours, to undergo a mandatory two-week quarantine. Uh, even now, when the danger of the China virus seems to be receding, they still have, thanks to their governor, a two week quarantine for anyone who stays in the state more than 24 hours. Now, you and I know, and our listeners know that Connecticut is a small state. There are lots of people who go from Connecticut commuting into to New York City every day. Uh, there's a lot of cross border traffic to other states to the north, Massachusetts, uh, to the east, Rhode Island. And the rule, however, really doesn't make sense. If you stay in the state more than 24 hours from someplace like Florida or Illinois, uh, you have to quarantine yourself for 14 days. Well, I was in and out of uh, Connecticut, I assure you, uh, in, 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 in the fastest time I could. Uh, but the state is largely shut down. Uh, I spoke uh, in a venue uh, that could hold, oh, 700, 800 people comfortably. The social distancing regulations in the state of Connecticut, as of two weeks ago, required that the audience be limited to 200. Now, take, take the case of Illinois, where I was a couple of weeks before that, uh, speaking at the Catholic uh, 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 Citizens of Illinois conference in downtown Chicago, we had a venue that could hold 400 people and the maximum number of people allowed in the room was 50. We were so socially distanced uh, that it was almost like being at a Biden rally. I mean, we, they were, the tables were so far separated and there had been a waiting list. Uh, there were hundreds of people who wanted to come to the event, but only 50 were allowed to, to actually uh, show up. Uh, so I could, I could go on and on uh, about the shutdowns in the democratically run states. It's almost as if the Democrats were anticipating this crisis. Uh, it's almost as if it didn't matter whether it would have been uh, health crises or uh, some kind of economic crises or some kind of uh, terrorist threat. It wouldn't matter what the crises was. Uh, they were all too eager to seize on the crises to really seize power. 
uh, seize power over the lives of the citizens of Pennsylvania and New York and Illinois, where we know uh, New Jersey, places like that, which have had the highest death rates uh, from the China virus because they did it all wrong. Mm -hmm. So contrast that with other states uh, that I've been in, uh, like Florida, for example, where the governor of Florida decided at the outset of the China virus and took tremendous criticism for this. So governor Ron DeSantis said, we're not going to lock down the state. I'm not going to impose a mask mandate on the entire state or shut down small businesses indefinitely uh, in my state. Mm -hmm. I'm going to allow that decision to be made at the county level and at the municipal level, at the city level. And I recall very well, three months ago, I had uh, lunch with the mayor of Fort Myers, Florida, a city of 100,000 plus people. And uh, Randy Henderson uh, said to me, you know, there's a lot of pressure uh, on me from the progressives here, uh, the liberals here, to shut down small businesses, to shut down the restaurants and to make everyone wear a mask. He said, what do you think? And I said, well, I think that, that uh, America is a free country and that Americans are free people and that what we should do in the face of a new influenza, a new virus, a new health threat is tell people exactly what the risks are depending on their age, depending on their comorbidities, depending on whether or not they have pre-existing conditions, they can decide for themselves how much risk they're willing to take. They can decide for themselves whether or not they want to stay home and isolate themselves socially, or whether they're still willing to go out and uh, you know, have lunch on, a, uh, on an outdoor terrace uh, somewhere and continue on with life as, as, as usual. And he, Randy slammed his hand down on the table and he said, that's exactly right, he said. And he went back to the city council and, and voted against closing down the city of Fort Myers where we haven't had a spike, uh, mm -hmm. the feared spike in, in China virus cases. The vote was three to two. So Fort Myers and, uh, and many places in Florida stayed open. Some cities like Miami uh, did have partial shutdowns, but Governor Ron DeSantis did on the state level in Florida, exactly what President Donald Trump has done on the national level. He has let the decision be made as to how to react to the China virus made by, by local uh, decision makers rather than imposing a one size fits all uh, solution on, on the nation. And what we see from the other side, of course, from the, the Democrat, the socialist Democrats, oh. democratic socialists, whatever they're calling themselves these days is exactly the opposite. We see a one size fits all solution, a mask mandate for everyone in the United States. Mm -hmm. Even if you live in a county where they don't have any cases of the China virus, you're still gonna be forced to hide your face. Uh, I think that is fundamentally un-American. Uh, it's, uh, it's a violation of the individual rights that are guaranteed in the first amendment to the constitution. Well, uh, there seems to be a crescendo right now about the China virus that's tied to the election. Uh, the drumbeat from the media, I get the free over the transom news, uh, not required to subscribe to the New York Times and the Washington Post, as long as you only want to know about the virus. Mm -hmm. And their constant message is be afraid, be very afraid. Um, some folks are calling it an outright panic. Uh, is that your impression? Well, I call it uh, panic porn. I mean, it's, it's gone beyond uh, the news reporting now to become a political tool in the hands of, you know, not, not just the Democrat Party, but in the hands of the mainstream media, uh, in the hands of the permanent federal bureaucracy, uh, the people at CDC, the people at uh, NIH who uh, are, are really uh, denizens of the deep state. And, and want the party that continues to increase their budget in season and out of season to be reelected. Uh, it's the panic porn promulgated by international interests, multilateral interests, the UN, mm -hmm. the World Health Organization, uh, other groups overseas. And of course, behind looking behind all of that, of course, is China, uh, which, is, uh, which is more than happy to, to promulgate uh, China, pan China virus uh, panic porn to panic everyone into voting for their preferred candidate, who of course is, is none other than compromised Joe Biden. But you can see why, Chris, the, the, the uh, left-wing media, the mainstream media, the, uh, 
the lamestream media, as we now call it, why they should be focusing on the China virus, on, on, on producing and distributing panic porn, because what else do they have? What else do they have? Their candidate is horribly compromised by China. Uh, the Biden family has been taking money from China for many, many years. They have outstanding loans to senior members of the Chinese Communist Party. You can't get any more compromised than that. Uh, you have his record of 47 years in government uh, without, uh, it's a, it's a, a record of, of lengthy service, but of almost no achievements. So what else are they going to run on but the crises? Uh, now, of course, it's, it's more a man-made crises than anything else to try and distract attention from, uh, from America's real problems that come from China, but can be solved uh, by, I think, the most dynamic president uh, that we've ever had uh, in the last, in my lifetime anyway. So, um, you know, these are people who are putting their own interests, their own party interest uh, ahead of the well-being of the country, including the health and well-being of the country. Uh, they're putting their own preferred oligarchy, uh, their, the interest of their ruling class over the interests of democracy, over the interests of the majority of the American people. So that's what, that's, that's why I think we're seeing an, a spike, not so much in, in, in coronavirus cases, we're seeing a spike in coronavirus propaganda uh, here in the week uh, leading up to the most important election of, I think, your lifetime and my lifetime. Chris? Well, our, our new book, by the way, Pandemonium, free download at our website, folks, at pop.org, and it's selling like hotcakes because it's free. <laughs> uh, Steve, Pandemonium, uh, it's very interesting. I translated a lot of the Spanish uh, into the English, and it offers some fascinating voices uh, from many countries and from many experts, uh, lawyers, international lawyers, doctors, uh, about what's happening in their countries. Uh, let's address that for a minute. In countries like Sweden or Belgium, there's been a wide variety of, uh, of success and failure. Uh, what does that look like to you? Well, we have contributors to the book Pandemonium, uh, which of course is available for free download online from Europe, from Latin America, from all around the world. And their experience, of course, is very, very different. Uh, their experience is at least as varied as the experience of uh, Americans living in the 50 mm -hmm. states, um, where you've seen, we've talked about all the different wide range of reactions on the part of the uh, uh, limited government types, the Republicans who've tried to avoid lockdowns and the, the Democrats who have been on too, only too happy to impose lengthy immediate lockdowns that have devastated their economies. The same thing has played out on the international scale. Uh, we see the two extremes, of course, right now, as we speak, are probably Sweden, on the one hand, taking a fairly open approach, and uh, Great Britain on the other, which has now gone into its second lockdown. Oh, yeah. well, let's talk about Sweden first. A lot of people were surprised when the Swedish medical establishment, supported by the Swedish government, decided against a massive lockdown of mm -hmm. the Swedish economy. They decided against confining people to their homes. Uh, they were a little slow uh, on getting testing kits into the retirement centers, into the old age homes. So they did lose uh, some of the elderly early on in the epidemic, but they quickly remedied that and did the sensible thing in the face of a China virus that does two things. Remember the China virus was engineered to be very infectious so it spreads very easily. But it was also engineered to be very lethal. Uh, the infectious part was a success. The lethality, I think, fell short of what the Chinese Communist Party was aiming for. It was aiming for a China virus uh, that would uh, devastate uh, both the population and the economy of the world. They were trying to create a virus that would infect not just lung tissue, but all human cells. They didn't mm. succeed in that. They succeeded in creating a virus that disproportionately attacks the elderly. And it's in the elderly that we see the virus able to attack not just lung tissue, but, uh, but the lining of the arteries, uh, heart tissue, uh, and, and other kinds of tissue. Uh, but the goal was to create something, I think, much more lethal. 
So we have to protect the elderly because the lethality of the virus is disproportionately directed at them. Once Sweden figured that out, uh, they were able to do testing in the retirement centers. Uh, they were able to control access and you know, entrance and egress from the retirement centers and reduce the birth rate, uh, rather the, the death rate uh, dramatically, dramatically over mm -hmm. time. So there, they, they never uh, sought to and succeeded in avoiding crippling their economy. So while the economies of uh, Germany and France and Great Britain and other countries in Europe, which went into a full lockdown, were, were crippled, uh, the Swedish economy only showed a fairly slight dip. It couldn't avoid being affected by the rest of Europe because after all, most of the trade that Sweden does with uh, other countries goes to other European countries. And if your major trading partners are in lockdown, obviously your uh, orders for your goods and services are going to be diminished as a result. But they did things in Sweden the right way. Uh, they did things sort of the way that, uh, that things were done by Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida. Uh, they did things the way things were done by, by Governor Kristi Noem in uh, South Dakota, for example. Uh, they avoided the major lockdowns. Now, unfortunately, and I don't know why this was in, in, uh, is happening in Great Britain. I have a couple of theories. But unfortunately, Great Britain has now gone into a second major lockdown. Uh, they were locked down for months at the beginning of the China virus pandemic. And now they've locked down again in response to uh, increasing numbers of uh, China virus cases. And in fact, they've gone into a more serious lockdown this time around because they're telling people not only that they must stay in their homes, but that they must socially distance themselves from their family members within their very domiciles. Now think about that for a minute. It's bad enough to tell people they can't go out on the street, that only one person can go shopping for food. Uh, at any given time, everyone else has to remain in the lock lock, locked up. Uh, but this is an added level of social isolation because they've told family members now that they must distance themselves socially within their very home. So the father has to sleep in one room, the mother in another, the children are separated in other rooms, and they should not eat their meals together. They should eat their meals separately. What kind of insanity is this? Now, why is this happening? Uh, you might think that the prime minister who... It had his own very severe case of the China virus early on and had to be hospitalized, uh, may have been traumatized by that experience and is overreacting. Uh, but I also think that what's going on in Great Britain is this. Uh, Great Britain for many decades now has, has, so, has had socialized medicine. The British Health Service has been underfunded for decades. The hospitals are are. Some of them should be condemned. Uh, they're poorly equipped. They're, they're, they, they, the, the equipment is backward. They don't offer the latest in, in techniques and, and therapies. And, and so they have served the British people in this pandemic very, very poorly. And I think that's a lesson for us all about the danger of going in the direction of socialized medicine. Because when push comes to shove and there's a major crisis uh, they will start doing triage immediately. They will start separating people out by those people who are young and still economically useful and give them what limited therapies are available. And they will simply take the elderly and they will warehouse them. Uh, there will be no treatment for them. There will be no therapies for them because therapy is in limited supply. Doctors and nurses are in limited supply because it's socialized medicine and it has a limited budget. And so I think that's why you see in Great Britain, mortality rates going up again because of the poor medical treatment available there. This is what happened in Italy in the very first stages of the pandemic. The Italian Health Service, another example of socialized medicine, which doesn't work, immediately began a kind of triage and there were, there were no beds for the elderly. There were no respirators for the elderly. There were no, no therapies for the elderly. They could barely see a doctor or a nurse. Mm -hmm. They were simply warehoused, set aside, and, and left to die. So um, I, I think one of the lessons that we have to take away from this pandemic 
is not only that it might happen again uh, someday, and we must be ready for it the second time, we were not ready for it the first time, uh, but also that uh, socialized medicine fails. It may operate fairly in a routine basis, in a normal uh, environment, health environment. It may manage to struggle along. But when you put a socialized medical care system under crises, uh, I'm afraid large numbers of people are going to die. Chris? Well, both uh, England and Sweden are about as advanced as you can get with regard to, and far too advanced in socialism, of course, uh, Sweden included. Uh, what's happening in underdeveloped countries in, say, Africa? Well, here's a very interesting contrast. Uh, you have uh, Latin America, which has had, for the past few months, uh, a fairly severe uh, encounter with the China virus. And, and then you have Africa, which you think um, is, should, should even be worse off than Latin America, because Latin American countries are, for the most part, uh, middle-income countries. Uh, they have reasonable uh, health care systems in place. And Africa, on the other hand, is still uh, filled, for the most part, with developing countries with some of the lowest per capita incomes in the world. And yet, while we have a serious um, China virus epidemic in countries like Peru and in Brazil, uh, we don't see large numbers of cases in Africa. Mm. And it's very curious why that should be. Uh, the reports coming out of Africa, I, I noted an NBC report uh, a few weeks ago coming out of Africa where the head of the African Health Commission was asked about why uh, they had so many, so fewer cases and such a lower mortality rate than many other parts of the world that were more developed. And he said, well, we have very good primary health care in Africa. And we saw the pandemic coming and we were ready for it. Well, anyone who knows the situation on the ground in Africa knows that's nonsense. The, the primary health care system in Africa has been over the decades crippled by the insistence of USAID and the European Union's aid agency and the World Health Organization that primary health care in Africa should primarily consist of preventing the Africans from conceiving and bearing children. So the whole primary health care system in Africa has been distorted by foreign aid programs and policies mm -hmm. that emphasize distributing contraceptives and sterilizing women and promoting the legalization of abortion over dealing with things like malaria and typhus and typhoid and yellow fever and so forth, the diseases that are endemic in, uh, in Africa. And yet there is one thing that is in favor of the Africans, and that is the fact that malaria is still endemic in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, every country um, south of the Sahara, all the way down to South Africa, still has a problem with malaria. Mm -hmm. And so when the malaria season begins in Africa, for example, during the, the, the hot season, when the mosquitoes are out buzzing about, everyone in Africa begins taking a drug called hydroxychloroquine. They mm -hmm. take hydroxychloroquine as an anti-malarial um, drug, a prophylactic, they don't wait until they have malaria. They take it to prevent themselves from getting malaria and if they have it to reduce the symptoms. Well, we know that hydroxychloroquine on the basis of well over a hundred studies now is very effective in preventing and minimizing the seriousness of uh, the China virus if it's taken very early. It helps less in the later stages there's been a major controversy about this in the United States, as we all know. Uh, and the president actually took the first time that the China virus managed to work its way into the White House. Uh, the president back several months ago actually took hydroxychloroquine as a prophylactic, did not get uh, the China virus that time, of course, got it later and was given other therapies, much more expensive therapies, by mm -hmm. the way. So for a dollar a day, you can take in Africa hydroxychloroquine. You're already taking it in Africa to prevent uh, contracting malaria. Uh, and so the China virus has had very little impact 
on the African continent. So there you have, I think, a continent-wide test case of the effectiveness, the, the, the efficacy of hydroxychloroquine in keeping down uh, the number of cases of the China virus and minimizing their seriousness when people are infected. And uh, hydroxychloroquine, I think, proves to be a very effective prophylactic against the drug. That's why Africa, and everyone thought there would be millions of deaths in Africa, Chris. That's why Africa's had very few deaths and is actually doing better than, say, Latin America. Well, it, every time I hear hydroxychloroquine, it's, uh, it's uh, said in uh, contempt uh, in the American media, making jokes about it as though it's a cure-all. And of course, it's because it's identified apparently with the president and uh, they mock it uh, rather than recommend it. Why is that? Well, again, I think there's, there's politics and profit at, at issue here. Ah. The politics of the matter are this, that if there is a fairly quick and easy uh, a solution to preventing the spread of the China virus, then the main issue that the democratic socialists have been using against the president and his supporters goes away. And that issue is what? That issue is the pandemic which of course, uh, which hobby horse they're still riding to the present day and which they hope to ride to victory uh, in, in, in a week from today. So they're interested in keeping the pandemic alive. Anything that ends it too quickly is not in their political interest. But there's another motive going on here. And it's the motive on the part of the drug companies in the United States who are busy developing very expensive vaccines and very expensive therapies uh, to deal with the China virus. Uh, rendisivir, for example, a series of treatments of rendisivir costs, according to the latest estimates I've seen, $3,100. There's a lot of profit in rendisivir for the drug manufacturers who will make this particular therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no profit for anyone who makes hydroxychloroquine because it's available for literally just a few cents a dose. Uh, we have, I know that uh, my friend Peter Navarro, um, who is in charge of industrial policy in the White House, uh, is frustrated uh, by the opposition to hydroxychloroquine because yeah. he's sitting on a national stockpile of hydroxychloroquine of 63 million doses, which have been set aside because uh, we often send troops not so much under President Trump, but we have in the past sent troops into environments uh, where malaria is endemic. And so we have lots of hydroxychloroquine uh, on, on, uh, in storage in, in warehouses uh, in the United States available for use. And members of the US Navy who are serving in Africa okay. right now and who are sending uh, you know, any troops that go aboard U.S. naval vessels into the Middle East, um, into the Middle East are given hydroxychloroquine uh, when they go into an area, a country, or an area where malaria is endemic. So this is a drug that's taken all the time by members of the U.S. military uh, with no bad side effects. It's a drug that I've taken on trips overseas to less developed countries. And uh, it's a drug that if it has any therapeutic use at all, against the China virus, you would think would be one of our first lines of defense. And yet, because the president mentioned it, uh, because it might indeed help to reduce the seriousness of the, of the pandemic, and because it might uh, cut into the profits of the major drug companies, um, everyone has been uh, talking it down, Chris. Well, you've got a uh, problem because uh you're being attacked right now by George Soros and organizations for spreading disinformation. Yeah. Um, here's one that we got over the transom. Uh, let's start with the first accusation. The director of your organization, Stephen Moser, has been spreading COVID-19 misinformation, including, and here's a free advertisement for our free ebook folks, just go to our site at pop.org and find out what George Soros is complaining about. It's 
our online book in English and Spanish and available from pop.org, free for download right now, claiming the virus was purposefully created by China. Uh, we've got a lot of folks out there who are hearing from this very well-funded group uh, that uh, were disinformation artists. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm the target of this smear campaign. Uh, let, me, let me just tell everyone that I have a background in the biological sciences. I was uh, all but doctorate in uh, biological oceanography many years ago. I've studied genetics with, uh, at Stanford University with Dr. Uh, Luigi Cavalli Sforza, who's a well-known geneticist. And of course, I'm a, a China hand uh, by training. I speak, read, and write Chinese, so I understand what the Chinese Communist Party is up to. I've been tracking their misbehavior for a long time. And then misbehavior begins uh, in the 1980s with the creation of a biological weapons program, uh, the fruit of which we are now suffering from today because as I said earlier in the show, uh, the China virus was created in a lab using a Pe People's Liberation Army backbone. There are two insertions, one intended to make it more infectious, the other to make it more lethal. The first worked very well, the second not so much, although it does target the, el target the elderly. Uh, there, is, there is almost no dispute now among people who've actually studied the issue in depth that, that this is an in, all, in all probability a laboratory creation. The other explanation, Chris, is that it came from nature, all right? So it is the case that sometimes bacteria and viruses jump from one species to another. They jump from uh, an animal to man. And so the initial argument put forward by the Chinese Communist Party to deflect attention away from the laboratory origin of the virus was exactly this, that this was a bat coronavirus that somehow made its way from a bat into uh, humanity and has spread from there. In, in order to back up this phony explanation, on February 17th of this year, after the pandemic had begun, the head of the Wuhan Institute of Virology's P4 lab suddenly registered a new bat coronavirus, hitherto unknown, called RATG13, registered it with the National Institutes of Health. And Dr. Shur, her name is Dr. Shur Zheng Li, the woman who gave us the China virus, who engineered it in her lab, registered this new bat coronavirus and said, look here, world, I have found the natural analog of the China virus. You see, it came from a bat and here it is. It's almost the same as the China virus. So that was the cover story. And it's a cover story because if you look closely at the genome of this bat coronavirus that she suddenly discovered and registered on February 17th of this year, you see something very strange. You see that the 29,000 nucleotides in the RNA backbone of this China virus are almost identical for long, long stretches with the China virus. I think, and those of us who've looked at it think, that what she did was she took the China virus, which she had made in her lab using this People's Liberation Army backbone, and typed in a new virus, which she registered as RATG13. Now, no one has ever seen this virus in the wild, no one has a sample of RATG13. I believe, we believe it only exists on her computer where she typed in the symbols representing 29,000 nucleotides and sent off that paper document to the National Institutes of Health after belatedly, after the virus had already reached epidemic proportions, just in order to be able to say, see, I found the natural analog, the precursor of the China virus, here it is. And you have to say, Dr. Schur, where's the sample of the virus? What bat did you isolate it from? Show me the sample of the actual virus in your lab. Well, that will never happen. No one has been allowed in the Wuhan Institute of Virology in the P4 lab uh, from, from almost its inception in February of 2017. And well, now that we have 
Uh, now that they've released the China virus on the world, no one will ever be allowed in the lab again from outside of China. So, um, so George Soros and his, uh, his people who are in the business of, uh, of, of creating panic porn for their own uh, global elitist interest can say all they want uh, about uh, protecting the Chinese Communist Party from the accusation that this was made in the lab and didn't come from nature. But indeed, uh, the evidence shows that it did come from the lab. It did not come from nature. Uh, you can see the hand of man uh, in the backbone of the China virus that we're all dealing with now. I actually take it a compliment uh, that George Soros has taken notice of our book, Pandemonium. I think that uh, the truth will always come out in the end. I also think that, uh, that darkness always hates the light. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, George Soros is the source of, of great darkness in the world today, Chris. Well, that uh, first of all, it sounds like there's a lot of information flowing the other way. It's very common in the dialectic to accuse your, uh, the good folks of what the bad folks are themselves are doing. It's classic from Lenin, from uh, right on down to Perón. Uh, it, it's a very common enterprise because it gives the wrong guys more time while the people are caught off balance, the good folks, uh, who are not so accustomed, frankly, to lying their way through life. Hmm. Well, now, here's another complaint of the same crew. Uh, Moser has links to Trump, including by sitting on an anti-China lobby group with former Trump advisor, Steve Bannon. Uh, Steve, are you anti-China? Well, I'm, I'm anti the Chinese Communist Party, which <laughs> is the biggest killing machine in human history. The Chinese Communist Party's first and foremost victims, of course, have been the Chinese people, but its victimization now extends well beyond its borders uh, to include really the people of the entire world who have all suffered, uh, not just health-wise, but I think economically as well, from the pandemic unleashed by China on the world. So when I call it the China virus, it's not a reference to the Chinese people. It's really a reference to the Chinese Communist Party. So I suppose we should call it the CCP virus um, because people will die from this virus, not only directly, uh, there will be people in poor countries whose economies have been devastated, who yeah. will literally starve to death because of the China virus. The economic dislocation has been so serious. These are people, there are people in Africa who are living on a couple dollars a day. Uh, and when they can no longer sell their goods in the market because the market's been closed down, uh, when they can no longer um, participate in, in the cash economy, uh, when the local economy has been shut down, uh, they and their children will grow, grow, go hungry and they may not die from the China virus, but if you're malnourished, uh, you can fall prey to other diseases. Uh, you can drink polluted drinking water and get gastroenteritis and, and die from, from excessive diarrhea. Uh, you can die from yellow fever and, and, uh, and typhus and typhoid, the other diseases that are endemic in some of these places. So uh, China, the Chinese Communist Party, which has killed 100 million of its own people, is now, through the China virus, uh, killing many other people around the world, both directly and uh, more importantly, indirectly, and indirectly in our own country. Amen. And, and you know uh, that, that we recently had on our staff at the Population Research Institute uh, an EMT. And at the very beginning of the China virus spread in the United States, I asked our own in-house EMT who was working in the evenings, answering calls on the weekends, uh, desperate calls, 911 calls from people uh, suffering from various problems, that if she was seeing a lot of China virus cases. She said, well, we're seeing some sign of China virus cases, but more often we're seeing drug overdoses and suicide attempts on the part of people who are depressed because they've lost their jobs or their small business has been shut down and they don't know how they're going to buy food and pay their bills. These are also victims of the CCP virus. These are also victims of the China virus. And I have to say that America has been very blessed over the past few months of this pandemic to have in the White House a sober-minded, sensible, prudent businessman 
who was determined from the very beginning that the cure for the China virus would not be worse than the disease. Because if you wanna see uh, the cure being worse than the disease, all you have to do is go to visit New York and, and go to one of the uh, retirement homes in New York where a third or a half the population of the retirement home uh, contracted the China virus this past summer and are now uh, dead and buried as a result of the mismanagement uh, by a governor of a state who let the cure uh, for the China virus be worse than the disease itself. Chris? Well, when you look at the United States as a longtime teacher, it hurts me to see the tens of millions of kids who are from kindergarten right on up through graduate school uh, who are forced to uh, become isolated even when they are together in class. Uh, uh, our daughter went to Notre Dame this past weekend. Uh, by the way, she's in graduate school in Toronto and can't even go to across the border. Mm -hmm. uh, she has made wonderful friends there through this kind of uh, distant two-dimensional uh, contact. But there are kids who are all over the country who are being deprived of the normalcy of community and friendship and uh, one father of a Notre Dame student wrote me uh, yesterday and he said, uh, uh, our son's very happy there, but he said, there are other kids who kind of feel like him. The kids are conservative. They feel like him and uh, that's hard for people to kind of congregate in little groups of interests that they share because of these stupid rules. And you can never tell behind a mask and a six foot separation, uh, what's kind of, uh, it, it just stops social living and community, stops it cold. And that uh, we know that local communities, including institutions like schools are indelibly important when the alternative is for the government to be telling you what to do and no intermediate, uh, an intermediate uh, locus of uh, protection from that government. For instance, now they're talking about, uh, I think uh, Mr. Biden had in mind uh, being masked all next year. And uh, in England, as you point out, my gosh, you're supposed to have plexiglass between you and your wife. I mean, this is inhuman and it will have long range impacts that the politicians don't have to take credit for because they will be long gone. Yeah, exactly, Chris. Uh, you know, we, um, my wife and I homeschooled our children for years, and, but we were always alert to the need for socialization. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when you have a large family, of course, that's less of a problem because uh, we had eight or nine children running around all the time so they could play among themselves. But we always would get together for athletic events, sporting events, sporting practice. Uh, we would get together for other uh, other classes as well in groups. Uh, but to shut down all of the schools and go to uh, instantly overnight to online learning uh, has been a disaster. I know that the state of Texas uh, Board of Education has said that, uh, that anywhere from 40 to 70% of the students in Texas are failing their classes uh, when they go online. Uh, some people uh, simply, you know, if you're young, young children simply can't relate to their teachers online. They need that physical presence. Uh, they need to have the teacher literally, in some cases, in their face teaching them uh, rather than remotely behind a screen. Uh, my daughter uh, is downstairs right now teaching her six-year-old because in her state of North Carolina, again, run by a Democrat, all the schools were shut down early. They're still shut down today, and they went to online learning. Now, we haven't been told uh, by the state of, of North Carolina how many students are failing uh, those online courses, but I will tell you that my own grandson was not able to relate to his teacher online, and so we've had to do homeschooling in his case, and I think that, that story can be retold by the millions across the United States. But think about these children who are failing their online courses, who are not being socialized, who are losing probably at the end of the day, a year's worth of education 
uh, which is a big chunk uh, out of the 12 years that you have to go to school to graduate from high school. And they will be permanently set back. Mm -hmm. So that's another cost. Uh, and I think over time, it will prove to be a huge economic blow uh, to the US economy because this generation of children will, will graduate from high school and college, perhaps less well equipped uh, than the previous generation or the one that follows them because they've been denied a year's worth of education. There are real costs associated with this as well. So we need to get back to a normal, I think as quickly as possible, especially when you see the numbers, 99.999% uh, .99 of children under the age of 18 uh, have no danger of uh, dying from the China virus. They may become slightly ill. They may show no symptoms at all. A uh, very few might become more seriously ill with flu-like symptoms. But there's no reason why we can't put the schools back in operation today, except for politics, except for politics. Well, right there, I noticed today that the Chicago Teachers Union has refused to go back to school, period. Uh, slam dunk. And what you describe about the children also applies to us professors because uh, the door swings both ways. Uh, I, uh, maybe it's because I worked my way through school as an, uh, a musician, but I face-to-face -face contact with people with whom you're having a conversation, uh, whether it's musical or uh, in, in language, they, these are indispensable. And to look at faces on the screen, it's hard to tell who's scratching her head about what you just said about Aristotle or uh, shaking his head because he thinks you're uh, out of your mind. Good, that's where you need to come connect and make an overture that comes with language, with uh, including body language. Uh, these are real people. These aren't faces on a screen. Yeah, Chris. Chris, I was I was uh, spoke at Hillsdale College a few weeks ago. Now Hillsdale College, run by my old friend Dr. Larry Arn, never shut down, despite the fact that they were in the People's Republic of uh, Michigan, run by the now famous uh, Gretchen Whitmer, who wanted to shut down everything and everybody forever. Uh, he refused to shut down the school. He did abide by the re the, the regulations put out by the health department, uh, but he said. Uh, at the conference at which I spoke, that if he had a choice between sending the professors home or sending the students home, he'd keep the students and send the professors home and let the students read their books and interact among themselves because that's, that's right. where so much of the learning takes place. Uh, these are, you know, you remember the, the sessions that we had when we were in college, uh, in our dorms, in local coffee houses, uh, talking about what we were learning and how excited we were at the new concepts we were grasping. Some of the learning occurred in the classroom, to be sure, but much of it occurred in small groups when we got together and shared ideas and talked about the, these exciting new vistas, intellectual vistas that were opening up to us. So uh, the, the, the young people who are being deprived of that, uh, in my opinion, should get a complete rebate on their college tuition because well, they're that, being denied what's most important about their learning experience. Well, that goes for us old guys too, because uh, some of my most interesting, I spoke at Hillsdale a lot in the 70s and 80s. And the wonderful part was afterwards, Hillsdale had these wonderful uh, long weekends where their speakers would be on campus for the entire three and a half days. And uh, you'd have groups that were required to uh, uh, attend, but then you mixed with the kids for the rest of the weekend and people who were interested would come up with new questions. And of course, that personal intercourse was phenomenal. And uh, I hate to think that it's going to be ancient history someday, but let's move along because we've got more complaints from our Soros friends. Uh, your organization also has close links with Citizen Go, including through your regional director who sits on its board. You have previously provided training for this group, which has connections with far right parties. There you go, across Europe, and who recently launched a petition to defund the WHO. 
Now that's the far left speaking, Steve. Uh, what's the story on Citizen Go? Well, Citizen Go is a, an organization of uh, uh, citizens from around the world who join together uh, online uh, to promote causes and to sign petitions and to deal with problems uh, that are created by uh, leftist organizations uh, like Open Democracy, which criticized us, and uh, leftist billionaires like um, George Soros, who want to fundamentally change uh, mm -hmm. the way America looks and behaves and, and believes. And, and I'm actually proud to, to participate in Citizen Go activities internationally, just as proud as I am of, of, of the fact that I am a member of the Committee on the Present Danger, China. Uh, we had a Committee on the Present Danger back in the 1950s, 60s, sure. and 70s. And the present danger at that time was that defunct country, formerly known as the Soviet Union, which we caused to collapse by rebuilding our military and cutting off technology and funding uh, to this um, organization in the 1980s. It no longer exists. But there's a new danger on the horizon, and that is China, under the misrule of the Chinese Communist Party. And so our new Committee on the Present Danger is the Committee on the Present Danger, China, which is mm -hmm. a danger, of course, we now see not just to the Chinese people, but to the entire world. So I'm proud to be a member of that committee, which I think uh, is addressing the primary geopolitical threat uh, that the United States and the world faces today. And uh, we must work for the same kind of uh, end game that we saw with regard to the Soviet Union. And the end game is the collapse of the Chinese Communist Party and the restoration of freedom uh, to the Chinese people, uh, the freedom that it was beginning to enjoy in the 20s and 30s under uh, nationalist rule. And finally, I would also say that I'm proud of the fact, although I'm sure that uh, the Soros organization uh, hates this even more, I'm proud of the fact that I'm a member of the Catholic Advisory Group for the Trump campaign in 2020. And that's a reprise for me because I was a member of the Catholic Advisory Group for the Trump campaign in 2016. And I must say that four years of kept promises of wonderful appointments to the Supreme Court, to the federal bench, wonderful pro-life policies put in place, uh, a new Mexico City policy that stops any funding from the US government, from any federal agency, to going to any organization that promotes or performs or lobbies for the legalization of abortion around the world, those are all wonderful achievements. And I think everybody uh, on the uh, pro-life side of the equation, everybody on the pro-family side of the equation, everyone who's really concerned about liberty uh, in the broadest sense, freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of association, should understand that that's really all on the ballot uh, this November 3rd. And that all that might very well go away if things go against us because America's institutions uh, from the federal government, from the media, uh, from academe, Hollywood, have all been corrupted. And if we want to continue to have representative government in this country, uh, we must vote for uh, the man who, uh, I think, ahead of all, all others, has stood up for middle America, has stood up for ordinary Americans, and has really stood up for the American dream, as envisioned by our founders over 200 years ago. Chris? Well, I want to tell our listeners that uh, we're going to go further into these issues on Wednesday at three o'clock in the afternoon Eastern Standard Time from the international point of view, including the United Nations, WHO, uh, some of the international businessmen and technology companies that are having such an impact, because that is a feature of several of the articles in the free ebook that we are offering you right now on our website for an ebook download and PDF form, Pandemonium. Pandemonium covers so many different countries and so many different facets. We're gonna be covering those on Wednesday. And Steve, I think it's time that we uh, take a look at the, uh, uh, I just wanna mention that uh, there's one more allegation that the Soros organization made. We'll probably talk about it uh, next week, next Wednesday, because 
you've campaigned to encourage pro-life and pro-family voting in the presidential and congressional elections in Peru. Well, they're giving us some free advertising and we'll discuss that more next week. So I wanna thank everyone who's been joining us today to come back Wednesday afternoon. I'm Chris Mannion. Our guest has been Steve Moser from the Population Research Institute at pop.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.